I'm Richard and I'm from Darwin and I work at a place called Merger Collective and today we're going to be talking about uh, making 3D graphics on the web. So the title is just a play on that. So. And yes, so it's obviously covered that. I've been to four dev worlds, uh, I think, a couple more. I've been to a few, I've been going for several years now. And um, obviously I'm very interested in games and I, I don't, I, I, like, I like them beyond just playing them. I like to actually study them and understand them and sometimes hack them and stuff. So I've done a few different things, even dabbled in emulators. I actually managed to get like a Game Boy thing running on the web before, you know, just, just for the sake of you know, testing it and proving it. Um, but at the moment I'm mostly doing web development and uh, a lot of client side and when I'm lucky, because it's Darwin, a few mobile apps. And yeah, as I said, it's Mojo Collective. So um, topics that I'm going to cover today, or why we're why we talking about 3D on the canvas and the web. I mean, there's lots of options there. Obviously, there's a lot of native um, things like uh, scene kit and that. Um, and then I'm going to talk about something called 3GS, which is uh, a framework to allow uh, programming through uh, the canvas made really, really easy. And then I'm going to talk about some of the cool third-party plugins you can add to it to add a lot of things that you get from like a, a proper fully-fledged uh, model editor or something like that um, without having to do very much to it. Um, and then show you how to animate on the web as well. And also look at writing your own loaders. So like if you've got like a, a model file that you want to load in that might not be automatically supported, how you can actually go about doing that. And then we're going to look very lightly at GSL shaders. Um, sorry, GLSL. So one of those ones. Does anyone actually know what those are? Or oh, not really? Sort of, yeah. Um, it's basically just um, raw open glide code that gets put straight onto the um, on, onto the renderer, um, but it's, it's done, done at a level which you can sort of write it out as. Um, I'll look at that a bit later. Um, so, why, why am I talking about 3D Canvas? Well, um, obviously, as I said, I like playing games. And sometimes, I like a game so much, I want to do something more with it. So, sometimes I will hack it. And Borderlands 2 was the um, one that sort of started this little story. And um, the, the thing I found with Borderlands is they have this uh, gun system which has uh, so many different combinations of parts. And... The problem as a player is that there's uh, not a lot of real way to sort of figure out, hey, is this gun I got good or crap? So, um, as I said, it, parts, and so different manufacturers also have their own parts. So you can get a gun where a handle could be from one, one manufacturer, whereas the nozzle could be from another. And um, in, in the game, uh, they only have a very basic interface for explaining this. So... Um, and I'll just show you right now. So as you see here, when you go and inspect the gun in the game, you can see the, the, the gun and its model, and then you get like a basic... Oh, so the, the, the unique name of the gun is the conference call, and the prefix for it is a practical... practical um, so not a lot of information, so you can't sort of understand, like, what's this gun made up of and all that. So this is where I started digging. And so as you see here, this is a fan-made um, breakdown of, like, just a shotgun by itself, all the different parts. You see, you've got like um, different barrels from different makes, they've got different models to them, and, and scopes, and you name it. So, and as you see here, here's a breakdown from the, the uh, gearbox guide for Borderlands 2. As you see, it's got all these different parts um, that make up a gun and then will affect its um, efficiency and, and how it fires and that. So my first attempt was uh, I was taking high-res screenshots using, I think uh, I, was using, I was hacking the save file so I could just get one part of the model and then take a screenshot and all that. That was a shit idea. So I ditched that. So next up, I booted up Parallels because obviously no one has a Windows computer. I found a few third-party um, applications that deal with extracting files from Unreal Engine games. And as you see there, that's... The file that holds all of the, um, I think it's the shot, shotgun. So that, that's all the shotguns. So you see there, they've got all the different parts, all just crammed into one model file. So, and as you see, it's got no textures, no nothing. It's just straight mesh data. Um, so yeah. So next step is now that I've got that model data. I've figured out a way to export it out. I need, to, I need a model viewer. 
So um, previously when I've made like little hacky games, I used to do a lot of stuff in Java. Um, but as I sort of found, it took a long time to build the interfaces and obviously as interface, I sort of see myself as an interface designer. I take forever iterating through until I find something that I like. So like I think at the time when I was last doing a Java thing, I was really into the Adobe interface. You know, you could drag and drop bits and pieces. And so I was trying to simulate that in Java and it just took forever. So um, yeah, I've, it's also been a very long while. Like I've been doing web development for a long time now. So it's, I didn't really want to jump into a Java application and start building this sort of thing from scratch. And as you see, this, this is actually what my um, app looked like. So I was doing, at the time I was very much into DS games and I was grabbing the files out and making my own little editor. And I think this by itself took at least six months work just to get an interface up like that with a model view or let alone an editor or anything like that. So uh, it was quite time consuming. And what's become of it? It's now a hex viewer. So is anyone familiar with hex viewers at all? Or? It's handy when you get like a file from a client, you don't know what the hell it is, and you just want to open it up to see what it is and see if it's anything malicious or whatever. So, so let's go back to, as I mentioned, 3GS. So it's a library um, that basically makes 3D in the web much easier. Um, so, uh, GSL is, is, as I said, it's actually just like raw code that's pushed out into the renderer, and if you were to do this from scratch, It'd take a lot of lines of code just to do something as simple as running a box on the screen. But um, there's these dudes out there that have put the time in and made, made a framework to make this way easier for you. So we'll look at that. So a basic scene is, um, what was that, maybe 20, 20 so lines of code? So this is where we're creating a scene, um, we're drawing a box onto it, and then we're creating a, your, your basic loop just to run through and then rotate it a couple times. Um, and as, as you'll see there, I'm... These are all pulled from actual uh, documentations from the 3GS website, and they've got tons more. Um, so now we'll just go to a demo, and I'll just show you this first one. Obviously, it's not that fantastic at the moment. It's just a box rotating, um, and I've just added a bit more code so that way it resizes to fill the window. And if we just have a quick look there, again, the code is pretty straightforward. Um, create a scene, the camera. I assign it to a canvas. Uh, create the box, set of material, obviously, and then um, and this little bit of code there is just for resizing the window. Um, yeah, so it's, it's not that interesting as is by itself. So next up, we need some more information. So obviously this box is running, but I can't even tell if it's if it's um, running fast or what sort of performance it has. So we can add some third-party controls. Uh, and, and or third-party plugins. So two plugins I'm quite fond of is one called Orbital Controls, and the other one's called Statistics. So um, Statistics is like so you can see the frame rate, um, and uh, Orbital Controls is a type of interface which allows you to scroll horizontally. Um, I, I think it also do vertically as well, and because there's also an issue with um, rotating 3D models. If you ever heard of Quantarians, I don't know how to pronounce it. But it's basically a, a, a flaw in, in the way that they calculate things. And that's why um, rotation is now done with three, uh, four variables instead of x, y, z. Um, it's complicated. I don't particularly stand myself. But basically, it's, it's like the solution to fix that problem. Um, but it, it sort of sorts it out all for you. Um, so yeah, let's learn and look at another version with controls in place. A little bit fast. So this now I've got some controls. I can rotate it. I can zoom a bit too fast. I can move it on the side, and I didn't have to implement any of that. I believe it's actually got touch controls implemented as well. So you'll have some basic touch if you were to pop this onto a mobile device as well. Um, and as so this is just one of the um, pl uh, control plugins that they created. Another one is called uh, I think it's Trackball Controls, and that. That, that will give you a slightly different sort of way to interact with your 3D models. But as you see, I think all I really added there was a couple extra lines of code, and then I had that implemented. So we, at, we created the statistics, and then all we just do is inside the loop, we just run update. So not that hard. And same thing um, with the orbital controls. So where are we? Where did it go? I think I put it here. So I set it up. And then once again, uh, just call update in the animation loop. 
So for full, full, full controls of like four lines of code. So moving on. And there are also other tons of other examples on there. So like this one is here I found was uh, someone's replicated Minecraft with full full interface. So um, actually might might actually load this up so you can sort of see it. Actually, I haven't got my internet set up, so I'm off sh if got time, I'll show it up afterwards because <laughs> these are online. Um, but yeah, they, they've got stacks and stacks of examples. There's some really cool stuff in there. Like uh, there was one I saw where they had like a screen just chock full of polygons, and you can move the mouse over each one and select each one. And um, it, 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 so you can do this sort of stuff with very little work involved. So. Um, what, what you could potentially use it to make some really cool stuff. So going back to what I was doing before with my Hello Hacking project, I've now got some 3D model formats, which are so so looking at X, uh, Borderlands 3, uh, sorry Borderlands 2. It's running on Unreal, it's running on a un modified Unreal Engine 2. Um, so they they've added some stuff on top, and they've probably done some stuff to customize with the internal workflows, and the um, the raw models, um, if you were to inspect what's inside Unreal, um, they, they have the, they're sort of set up in a way where they're, they're designed to run inside this uh, con uh, cooked package. Um, and they're not really designed to sort of pull out and then sort of view up separately. Uh, and um, the, that particular editor you saw before that I was using, it allows you to export models as a PSK, which is a sort of like a a shareable model format from Unreal, and the PSAs are the animations for animations. But the problem with these two is that all the material information is lost. So whether that means that the material was actually part of the Unreal Engine or it was customized specifically for Borderlands 2, I'm not sure, but it was an, another issue I found when I was trying to get the graphics out. And also textures are sort of kept in this one big, like, two gigabyte file. Um, well, actually, this is like a six gigabyte file, and they're all compressed, um, ready to go straight onto the graphics engine. So, like that particular app, when I exported, it exported all them out as um, TGAs. So, again, not a format that's really great for the web. So, yeah, and obviously now that we've got these files, we need a loader. So, 3GS comes with a bunch of loaders already um, built in, uh, or, or that you might just have to include the JS file that includes it. Uh, that has it installed. And um, generally what happens when you call this loader, it'll load the file and then return some sort of geometry file or maybe the uh, top level mesh, um, which you can then literally just, uh, as you saw with that box, you just replace that with adding this geometry and um, then it'll render it straight into the screen. Um, so looking at the next little demo, um, I've one, one of the demos that are on the website I quite like with this little knight dude because um, I was using it trying to learn animations. So I'm just using this little dude here. Um, as you see there, it's loading in a um, model. It's got its own, um, uh, so, so, its own uh, materials in place. And um, all these, it's actually got bones and that, but I haven't actually loaded them yet for this one. So, and if we just go to the demo. So... It, I've, I think I've included, actually no, this is actually built in because this is a, a JSON file. So in, in order to, so there's some light stuff that you don't really have to worry about. It's just, just so you can actually see the actual model. Um, otherwise it's sort of black. But you see here, loader, I've just created an instance of the loader um, object, loaded in the, um, the, the file. Notably, you won't be able to load this in on a, a local host because... Uh, sorry, you know when you open up the file directly on the computer, you won't be able to run it because it will have a cross-origin issue. Um, but if, if it's on a server, it's not an issue, or if you've got like a, a MAMP or something like that. Um, so yeah, and then it returns the, geom the geometry and the materials, and then just feed that into a mesh, uh, apply some shadow casting, drop it onto the, the scene, and then yeah, then it's just straight on like that. I think I'm talking a little bit too fast. <laughs> okay, so um, next up, we shall look at bones and skeletons. So again, uh, it's actually quite easy to load this in, provided the, the loader supports this. And um, 
there are also other helpers that can make visualization. So, like when you're loading a model, you sort of want to know where those bones sit because maybe if you're creating a custom one and the bones like over there, you sort of want to know where it is displayed. And it's actually quite easy to visualize that um, using built in stuff into 3GS. And um, there's also one little thing that I sort of missed when I was playing around with this is that if the material doesn't have skinning set to true, the model will just stand there as it is in its default spot and just ignore any of the bone stuff, so it can be a little bit annoying. So, moving on to demo four. Unfortunately with this one, the model's actually the same setup as where the, the bones are, so you can't actually see that he's actually um, hooked in, but I'll show you in the next one once we had some animation that he's actually been fully skinned up. And just to show you how much code that was to make him skinned, as I said, the, the, all, all the bone stuff is actually part of the geometry object that comes through, so you don't have to really worry too much about the bones, um, provided that they're being handled by the loader. So really all I had to do to make that skinning was I just had to make sure that the materials had skinning enabled. And yeah, and then as you saw there, you saw how these, these, um, the skeleton there. To do that, all I had to do was add a couple lines of code to create a helper, a skeleton helper and attach it to the mesh, and then in the update loop, uh, which is here, I just had to run update, and then that way it actually updates all the skeletons. And so obviously when you add another model and all that, you just create another helper, and then it update it like that. Um, okay, so moving on. So animations. Uh, as it says, it supports them, and there's also an animation helper, which will actually do a lot of the work for you. So, and it does support morphing, if anyone knows what that is. Um, it's when you, instead of actual bone-based animation, morphing will sort of like morph objects and that, but um, I'm not sort of going to go into that because it's a bit more complicated and it's not really what I wanted to go on about. So, uh, just jumping back to my little dude. HTML5. As you see now, he's fully animated and pulling in all that bone starter. So, my computer's humming a bit, but I think that's probably because I'm screen recording. He's, he's, like he's still running at 60 frames per second, so it's, he's actually pretty good. I might just hide that so he's not running. So, now that we've sort of shown that you can load in um, known files quite easily, we want to create a custom loader because going back to those Borderlands files, they're a PSK. So, one, there's probably not going to be a lot of open source, unreal uh, loader files for 3GS out there, so we're probably going to have to write our own. And um, this is where that hex viewer that I had that's sort of become redundant in its original purpose is quite handy because you can open up these files and inspect them, sort of figure out where the data is, and then um, create your code for it. So this is the basic structure of what a, a custom loader looks like. Um, if, if you're all too familiar with prototyping and all that, um, I'm not, not really going to go too, too detailed, but it's, it's the basic structure. And from there, you'll, you'll load the file. You, you'll probably want to create a custom um, X, uh, AJAX request function to make sure you're receiving binary data and stuff like that. Um, unless, of course, your model files are um, text-based. So um, okay, well, I'll open up my one and just sort of show you what it looks like. So it's demo six. So this is one of the characters. You might notice it's missing a head. There's a reason for that. I didn't intentionally chop the character's head off. Um, but what this is doing is it's actually loading in uh, the model and the texture data from a PSK file. So what I'll do is I will open up PSK letter. So this, this is a custom letter I wrote for opening PSK and PSA files. So first off, obviously had to create um, a, a custom AJAX function to load the file. So where you're making sure you're getting the correct data because sometimes when you load files, it'll parse them as plain text or other crazy stuff. And then I'm just passing in into the um, the parent object. So we jump down to the um, binary loader. Actually, no, that's right. So here is my um, 
which you know that that's just a base class. This here is a fair bit of code because these files are quite complicated. But um, the key thing here I'm just trying to show is that I'm just implementing uh, the work involved and then just returning those files like the other, other loaders do. So that way um, it doesn't really matter what happens to this file. It's going to be passed as, as a usable model object that you can then use in 3GS. So here I'm grabbing points and I'm building this, um, this data structure which... Um, thanks to JavaScript, is directly passable into JSON. So as long as you understand the structure, you can actually create a, a raw JSON file, and then that'll load as a, a, a model. So yeah, we've got materials, we've got skeletons, and raw weights. Not sure how well the raw weights actually affect it. And then later we've got some animations as well. So. Uh, the animations took a bit of time, and that's where having that visual of the models helped because um, I didn't realize, I think I was off by like a few offsets in the file, and, and so all the, mod the, the animations are like all going in weird, funky directions, and I think it took me a week till I figured out that it was just a couple of, uh, you know, offsets off, and then it all worked, so. And you might see here, it's, it's got rotations for that, the, the quantarians, if that's how you pronounce it. So instead of just X, Y, Z, it's got a fourth one as well. Um, but it's, I don't have to really care about it. I just have to know that those variables are there and then I've correctly passed them in. And then 3GS will com convert that into something which is fully renderable and all that. So, um, yes. So, next up, we'll have a quick look at GSL shaders. So, um, as I said before, there are basically blocks of raw um, GSL code that gets sent straight to the um, straight, straight, right, straight to the renderer. And there are two types. They're called the vertex shaders and the fragment shaders. Um, sorry, and um, they, they work together to um, manipulate your graphics on the canvas. And the interesting thing is that 3GS is basically a, a bunch of these GSL codes structured into a framework to do all the work for you. Um, and, and the other cool thing is that they've set up in a way that you can actually grab these chunks and then use them in your custom shaders um, as opposed to um, having a... Because when you create a new, new shader, uh, it, it's literally from scratch. So like if you were just to plug in your model, the model wouldn't even render because it needs all that extra um, shader code to render. But thankfully we don't have to worry about that too much. Um, and another thing to sort of think about with the, the, the shaders is that currently they're still sort of in like a uncertainty about how they're supposed to be stored and represented. Um, the, the thing that, when they get sent to the render, they're always sent as text. And, um, but the one way you can do it, if you've got like a static shader, which might do like a post effect, you know, like a old TV style look, you can store that in, inside like a script tag. Um, using, but the, those tags aren't used in any particular way. It's just a way for you to sort of say, hey, that's a vertex shader, that's a, a fragment shader. Um, so, in order to create a shader, we have to grab a, an object called a shader material. Um, so, a lot of the work is done through the materials, which I thought was a bit surprising. And um, it has several components to it. They have these things called uniforms. Um, the descriptions are sort of pulled from 3GS. As I'm, I'm going to make it clear, I'm not a 3D programmer. I'm, I'm just doing this because obviously I had a desire to do something. Um, and so, we've got Uniforms, vertex shaders, and fragment shaders. And um, as I said before, when you use these things, they're literally from scratch. So if, if you've got all this complex skinning and all that stuff, if you haven't already got the code in there, it's just not going to do any of that. It's just going to ignore it and just use the shader straight as. And that's just the basic structure of creating this custom material. Um, and obviously, so... Um, so the reason why I needed to use a custom shader is because if you saw that model of the carrot, if anyone's played Borderlands at all, uh, it's kind of black and white. And the reason for that is that um, what the graphics artists do is they, they do like, the base texture in a flat color, and then they apply masking to apply different tints to the parts of the body. Um, and, um, and, and, and in order to store this, what they do is that they get an image, and they split each of the masks into a separate channel. And because that way it can be loaded into the um, the, the the render quite easy because it's got to switch the channel which which to load. 
um, as opposed to having a separate image for each mask, which is, adds more to the file size and that. And even with all this compression, all the graphics are still like several gigabytes. Like, uh, I think compared to the rest of the game, like 90% is just raw graphics. You know, like all, all the actual data in that is like this little tiny bit. Um, and yeah, as I says, it, they're using a single texture um, with multiple tints. Um, and the annoying bit with TGAs is, I'm not certain, but I think they do have alpha in TGAs, but uh, if you were just to load that into, um, into, into the web, it would probably ignore the alpha channel, and so it's not that sort of helpful. So here, here's what the graphics for that character look like. So on the left, you've got her flat grayscale textures. On the right, you've got an image which has all the masks in different layers. At first, I was quite stumped by what that was, because I understood it was a mask of some kind, but I didn't understand why there's these funky colors. And then one time it hit me and I opened up in Photoshop, switched it to a single channel, and suddenly it's like, oh, so that's like that part of the body and all that. So um, people that do graphics like this all the time, it's probably no big deal, but it's, it's uh, quite an odd thing to get your head around at first. So here, here's that character again. So you've got the, the base um, grayscale model. You've got a, render, a rendering of the three different channel masks pulled from that, those files laid on top, so you can clearly see, okay, you've got the chest piece, and you've got like, the sides, and you've got the pants and the hair. And then on the far right, you've got... Um, this is sort of my attempt at trying to simulate what the game does to tint these colours. Uh, in the real game, they're actually a lot stronger, but I haven't quite figured out the math, because, as I says, I'm not a 3D graphic artist, so um, I can only play around until I get it right. So, yeah, putting it all together, the, if, if you saw she's now got a head, that's because the way the game does it, because you have character customizations, you have both uh, body skins as well as heads, different heads you can have on. So the game stores these are two separate models. So in order for me to load in, I've got to load in two separate models um, and then apply textures. And then I think with the character customization, the skin will actually affect the head and there's all these other complicated things. and. That's without even get to the guns, so I, obviously I got a bit lost on a tangent when I was trying to get the graphics, so I just sort of stuck with the um, characters and uh, guns sort of got pushed off to the side. Uh, but I'll probably eventually get back to them and play around with them. But compared to what it took me to do like those DS stuff on the Java back in the day, I think I did all this over the course of like two weeks. Just like a straight, you know, stick into it sort of thing. Um, so. What I'll do now is I shall boot up my BL2 3 So this is was the result of my little, I suppose, hackathon thing that I did. So in the end, for all the materials, I had to create um, a PHP backend to sort of convert all the files into basically a JSON file, as it says. As long as you can replicate the JSON, you can basically pass it straight in as is. So I've loaded it in, I've got some animations going, which has to reload the page. So it's a bit sluggish, but um, it's just what I need is to be able to sort of visualize that it's all working in that. So, and you see there, if I hit, uh, whoops, wrong one, hit enter. There we go. So yeah, he's got fully animated. So that's graphics pulled from a game and then rendered on, onto the web. Um, so with, with, with the end goal that I wanted was I wanted to have some sort of like visualizer. So like if, um, say for someone to come and see what, look, look, see what a skin looked like, they could just load it up on the, the web view and then play it like that. Um, and yeah, and then you could like switch between characters. So going back to the mail. Does anyone actually play Borderlands at all? Yeah, it's cool. good. I'm not just throwing out random characters that people don't know about. That's good. So yeah, and then the uh, swap out the head. So um, as you see, there were a lot of heads in the game. So uh, hopefully, I can pick one that has. C c c with the TGAs, um, I was lazy, and so I wrote uh, a PHP script to convert a TGA to a PNG, and it. So that that's a skin, so it's changed to tint. But as you see, my um, tinting is not that good at the moment. So you can see a slight tint, but it's not coming through as good as it would in the game. Um, and yeah, I think change in the heads, but yeah, it's a cool little loader. Eventually, I want to get a gun one so I can like, load in a gun, specify the um, 
specify uh, which parts you want to use and then hook it into like an interface where someone could like write in, hey, okay, I've got a conference call with a uh, double penetrator as a prefix, put it in, it'll generate the gun render based upon uh, how they calculate the gun, uh, the, the, the gun's parts using all the bits and pieces, and then you get a render as well as the stats and all that sort of stuff, so you could level it up. Um, but yeah. So, I've put the code up for all the demos up on this GitHub. I might have to push it up again because I've made a few changes, but for the most part, they shouldn't have changed. Um, they're pretty straightforward, but a lot of them are actually pulled from the uh, JS website, so they've um, they're, they're got tons and tons of documentation, so it, it's, it's really handy. And the, the best thing with web that I love is that whenever you want to understand something, you just inspect it and then view the code, and you can sort of look through it, provide they haven't minified it, but... Even then, you find a JS beautifier, decompile it, and look through the code, so it's handy. Um, and yeah, my contact information, um, I don't really have a, tw I do have a Twitter, but I'm not using it, so it's Facebook and email if you want to.